We grow because we struggle. The writer Elsie Allen said once, we learn and overcome. From the age of 14, I had known myself to be a writer. I wrote short story after short story after short story, always secretly, but always seriously. They were my life within a life. I created characters and situations and places that said something to me about what I saw around me, about human struggle, about dark driving motives and hidden pain. Writing was all I ever wanted to do in life, in a world in which women writers were an almost totally unknown quantity. But at the same time, I had no idea how to go about doing it. And complicating the situation was the fact that I had wanted to be a nun even longer than I had wanted to be a writer. So in the end, I entered the monastery, but I went on writing regardless and, and began to live in two worlds, the, the world of, of secret writing and the world of the teacher. Why? Because what the community really needed was teachers. So I was allowed to major in English, but my secret hope went on. My secret hope was that I would also learn to write there by reading great writers. The literature program I was in was a good one but it was still a cavernous distance from the world of creative writing. But then suddenly, out of a black hole of nothingness, it seemed to me, word came from the prioress of my community that now that my undergraduate degree was completed, I was to apply for admission for a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at Iowa State University the then Mecca of professional writers. I remember that my hands shook as I signed the final registration papers, enclosed the writing sample, and sealed the large manila envelope. All this time, it finally seemed the superiors of the community had known what I really wanted, where I really belonged, and it was going to happen. It was going to happen here, in this monastery, and to me. It was January when I received the letter of admission. I would begin the two-year program in June, it read. I really don't remember much else about the rest of that year, except that every day seemed easier than it had ever been before. Every moment now was light. I was on my way. Mid-May came before I even realized that it was spring. And then out of nowhere, I got another telephone call. No explanation was ever given. All I know is that the purpose of that call from the very superior who had told me to make the application was to tell me that I was now to withdraw it. That it would, she said, be better for my humility to go to our children's summer camp as third cook than to go to graduate school. I was not, she said, ready for a master's degree. Now that may not seem like much to many, but to me, it began one of the greatest struggles of my life. It was, you see, the clear end of the dream, the loss of the hope. It was forced change at the center of my personal universe. How do we explain such things? How do we survive them? And most of all, what happens to us spiritually as a result. The great secret of life is how to survive struggle without succumbing to it. 
how to bear struggle without being defeated by it. How to come out of great struggle better than when we found ourselves in the midst of it in the first place. There are ways to survive the interruptions of life. We can, for instance, simply assume that life is a plan God has made for us. Then we see ourselves as a collection of dancing puppets on a string. We are simply victims of God's designs. Whatever happens, we know, happens because God wants whatever perverted, malignant thing it is. Everything then, they tell us, is God's will. God's will that the poor are poor, I guess. God's will that women are routinely beaten and routinely ignored. God's will that lives are ruined and children abandoned and villages full of the bombed out helpless. God's will that my life is warped and broken and desperately unstable. God's will. This spirituality feeds the notion that God is responsible for evil. Not we. Not I. We human beings are simply pawns in God's great godless game. Or a second way to deal with struggle, just as groundless, just as unhelpful as the first, is to assume that God is the magician who molds circumstances and consequences to our liking. This God makes red lights turn green. This God sees to it that death and suffering and pain become a kind of vending machine game. You put enough suffering in, you get a blessing out. In both those approaches, what makes the victim a victim is that they have failed. Either they believe too little or they feel too much. Either they don't accept God's plan for them or they don't accept the fact that pain is good, that unhappiness is better than happiness, that defeat is better than victory. But God is not a puppeteer and God is not a magic act. God is the ground of our being, the energy of life, the goodness out of which all things are intended to grow to fullness. Yet how can we possibly equate the two, a God of good with a life of struggle? But struggle, we learn as the years go by, is not without its own great gifts. To struggle is to begin to see the world differently. It gives us a new sense of self. Struggle tests all the faith and the goodness of God that we have ever professed we have. It requires an audacity we did not know we had. It demands a commitment to the truth. Struggle is what leads us to self-knowledge. It builds forbearance. It tests your purity of heart. Struggle, in other words, brings total metamorphosis of soul. If we are willing to persevere through the depths of struggle, we can emerge transformed. Enduring struggle is the price to be paid for becoming everything we are meant to be in this world. I can taste to this very moment the sick feeling that came with that phone call that would in the end change the entire direction of my life. 
I remember feeling tossed in the air like dry straw. I remember barely being able to breathe on the other end of that phone line. There went the short stories. There went the novels I would write. There went what I had wanted all my life. And all for no reason. All without cause. All without sense. And in its place, nothingness. What I did not have that day was the wisdom of soul it takes to see what would come in their place. That someday I would find myself writing fact instead of fiction, concentrating on the real rather than the maybe working with people rather than characters, writing my truth rather than my fantasies. In fact, I had no patience at all for the thought of anything else. What I did not have that day was the strength of spirit to imagine that whatever the pain of the change, there was something in it that would call more out of me than I ever imagined was there. The kind of struggle that shocks us into new beginnings is the kind of struggle that gives us new life. It forces us down unwanted paths. It leads us stumbling through the rills and recesses of the dark sides of the soul, angry, fearful, resistant, and unbelieving. But it also prods us from task to task in life until at the end we find ourselves full statured and full of grace. Indeed, as Alan says, we grow because we struggle, we learn, and overcome.